All right, let's get started. Um, thanks everybody for taking time out of your valuable afternoon to join us for this AppNeta webinar. This is called the Remote Monitoring Challenge, and in it we're going to look at uh, the differences between AppNeta's approach to monitoring versus what you might be more familiar with in terms of um, traditional monitoring technology. So, you know, we're specifically going to be talking about the differences here in the use case of you're trying to do remote location monitoring. Um, so maybe start with some definitions. What do we mean by traditional technology? In this case, you know, we call this device-centric data. This is data that you would typically pull for monitoring purposes using technologies such as NetFlow or SNMP. And just to complete the definitions, what do we mean by remote locations? Well, we consider it any company location that doesn't have its own data center that connects to a data center or cloud over any network, LAN, WAN, public, public internet, Wi-Fi, whatever it is. Most importantly, it's anywhere IT isn't that IT still needs to support. And that might be a retail store, hospitals, doctor's offices, bank branches, hotels, basically any kind of um, business that has remote locations. So, but before we get into it, some introductions are in order. My name is Damon Roscoe, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Atlanta. I'm joined by Alec from our product marketing team. Say hi, Alec. Hi. And we've got Christine helping us out with uh, webinar logistics and queuing up your questions. In terms of an agenda, here's what we'll be covering. Uh, we're going to have, first we're going to talk a little bit about remote monitoring as uh, sort of what are the general challenges associated with it. Then I'm going to walk through an example of sort of what it would be like to troubleshoot it using these traditional technologies. Then I'm going to pass it to Alec, and he's going to walk through uh, some of the differences between Abneta and those traditional technologies, our differences in approach. And then finally, we're going to finish it up by looking at how we would troubleshoot that same situation, um, but using Abneta technology. Some logistics. Today's webinar is being recorded. And the webinar recording will be sent out to everybody who signed up. So if you've come in partway through it, don't worry about it. We'll be sending it out. Uh, if you have questions, we love questions. We love being interrupted. So please interrupt us. Ask us questions. And we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, we may save some of them to the end if it, if it makes more sense. And if you're having difficulties, try a different browser. Um, GoToMeeting has been pretty reliable for us. So hopefully it will be for you as well. We talk about the remote location challenge a lot here at Atlanta, and that's because it's a problem that we see a lot. Here's the crux of the issue. IT is responsible for the performance of applications and networks at remote locations, but lack proactive continuous visibility at those same locations. The reason for this lack of visibility has to do with the changing way applications are delivered and the growing trend of the distributed enterprise, which simply means that IT has more locations to support. And this isn't a small trend. Organizations of all types are increasing the number of remote locations. And most of these are not going to be connected to your traditional MPLS. They're being connected by a public WAN. They're being connected using technologies like SD-WAN. And that's mainly because of the cost of speed and uh, the, the cost of it and the speed of deployment. And they're not just accessing the data center, center anymore. They're now accessing applications that have been moved into the cloud as well as SaaS applications. Um, and these are often distributed in themselves, and IT does oftentimes does not have control over the applications as well. And there's a lot of reasons why this is happening. There's the need for local presence, there's specific staffing requirements, costs, but the result is a tangle of application delivery paths among users, remote locations, data centers, and cloud providers. More importantly, many remote locations don't have IT staff, and that makes it difficult and time-consuming to solve problems because you're not there to see, and most importantly, feel what your end user is experiencing with the, with the business critical application. The end result is that IT becomes reactive and spends most of their time fighting fires. So why does an IT have more visibility? It's pretty simple. Most IT organizations lack the right monitoring tools for this new environment. Traditional monitoring tools were designed to gain insight from network devices that you owned and controlled. So you could hook in SNMP and get some data. But in this world, you don't, have, you don't own the infrastructure, and thus you don't have any data to pull. How do you monitor using traditional monitoring products 
the performance of a web app that takes into account both the application and the network performance. So let's look at how you would troubleshoot an issue at a remote location using traditional tools. So you've gotten a call from a remote office and they're having trouble accessing Office 365. What would you do? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try and access the application itself. Uh, everything seems fine. So then you go, because this is Office 365 and they have a status page, you're going to go and check the status of the Office 365 infrastructure. And that's an important thing, right? So you check that and it seems like it's up. There's no signs of an outage. You know, it's important to note here that you're actually not checking the application's availability to that end user. You're really just checking the infrastructure that supports it at Microsoft. So then you start to check your own infrastructure. You check your firewall, your Wi-Fi. Uh, maybe you go on to check the status page for your ISP. And then maybe you've set up, maybe you've been in, pro, tried to set up proactive monitoring. So you've set up tests with tools like web page tests that are pinging against Office 365 to see if it's up and running. All this is showing no problem. So then finally what you do is you remote desktop into a local machine and you try and troubleshoot it from there. So you, you might run a ping or trace route, and maybe you check the ISP path using an app. And then at the end of it, you discover that you, know, that the, you don't have a solution and you're not sure what's causing the problem. The, the important point with all of these is that you're testing a single point in time. If the issue here is intermittent, you're hoping that when you run the test that you're gonna see the problem happen. And then the second problem here with this approach is that by definition it's reactive, right? You're only dealing with the issue after the user has reported it. Appnet takes a fundamentally different approach to monitoring remote locations. Rather than looking at devices for performance metrics, we utilize an active testing methodology that provides visibility that you actually care about. That is, from the end user through any network to the server or the application. And we do this continuously, which means that you won't be, it won't be your end users telling you about issues. You'll know about them before they do. And if it happens in the past, which is often the problem, like you're trying to track down that ghost issue that you can't quite solve that keeps showing up, you can use your magic at time machine to rewind back to when the outage occurred. What do we mean by application delivery path? I'd just like to be really clear on these things. So we mean a specific connection between an end user and the application across any network. So here's one example, connecting from your headquarters, through the internet, through the public internet, uh, to a SaaS application, such as Office 365. And here's another example. So now you've got a remote office where the worker is connected over Wi-Fi, that's connected by a public LAN or maybe MPLS, doesn't really matter. And uh, they're connecting through, the, through some sort of internet connection to the data center. Um, so, you know, the commonality here that you can easily see is the connection over some sort of public network, even if that network connection is encrypted or guaranteed in some way in the form of MPLS. So with that, as sort of an introduction and context, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Alex who's gonna walk you through how I've met a difference and how you can become a proactive IT organization. We like to say that Appneta can help you lower your uh, time to invest by issues. And we've seen clients lower it by 70 or 80%. And that allows you to focus on how IT can help the business rather than just firefighting. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Alan. Thanks, Damon. Uh, so my, my part of the presentation basically is going to be talking about the uh, the different technologies that are available and what we can do uh, to uh, to actually uh, give you either more information or the same information with less overhead. And so monitoring solutions often use the same high-level language to describe what they do, uh, but they're all a little bit different under the hood. Uh, you can get better data granularity from some tools than you can from others, and a lot of this depends on where you're collecting from either at uh, your remote locations or some hub and spoke, there's BGP, Synthetix, uh, various technologies that taken separately don't provide kind of the full picture needed by IT uh, to actually solve the day-to-day -day problems. Uh, used as part of a set of tools, they can offer a lot of insight, but generally speaking, they, have a, they all have kind of drawbacks in their implementations. So we see IT as having kind of a few goals uh, today, getting ahead of problems before users know about them, 
explaining problems quickly and working to prevent them from happening again. Uh, and then often doing these across a large or even global footprint when you're more likely or not uh, in the, you're probably not in the same location uh, as the end user. So the technologies we use are designed to help IT meet these goals. Uh, so let's take them one by one. We know what NetFlow is. Uh, NetFlow, JFlow, SFlow all collect IP traffic and analyze flow data. Uh, normally there are two components, right? The collectors that sit on the network to summarize the data into records, usually NetFlow v9 or v10. Um, and then all of those records are sent to an analyzer for any of the number crunching before presentation to the user. Uh, and the data that NetFlow collects includes, you know, routing information, IP addresses, ports, a few other things, but it doesn't record everything. It's sampled. So it's not the same as viewing the raw packet stream and analyzing off of that. Uh, the router's main function is to move IP traffic from the source to the destination. Uh, anything that steals resources from that is kind of a secondary function. The other problem with collecting NetFlow data directly from the router uh, is that when we introduce the idea of application identification, something like NBAR2 from Cisco adds additional computation on top of the collection of flows. So, so you've taken your device that is meant to route all traffic uh, from a remote office and you've asked it to log a sample of those packets, uh, do analysis at the collector level, and then send it over uh, your network uh, to an analysis server. So if the goal is to see your traffic from a holistic point of view, uh, you're already limited with the summarized data provided by NetFlow. Uh, it'd be better to see everything uh, and with Fnetic, you actually can. So our monitoring points sit between your users and the internet so that we can collect the raw packet streams down for the WAN. Uh, using a span or mirror pipe, we actually avoid adding any additional latency to the traffic, but we're able to analyze that raw packet stream instead of that summarized data. Uh, we run our deep packet inspection uh, to learn more about the traffic and the conversations that are happening on the network, including looking for a retransmit rate per host and per user that's so often the culprit of congestion. Uh, so we also have an ever-growing list of over 2,000 applications that we can identify that goes much further and also is updated more often than something like NBAR2. So we, we take all that data, we take all that analysis, we package it up uh, actually in NetFlow v9 records, uh, primarily because it's familiar. Uh, and with v9, you actually have the ability to use custom templates and fields. So we're actually adding our metadata on top of the normal v9 records. Um, but uh, from the analysis side, this familiar, familiarity with uh, the NetFlow v9 format means that we can also ingest the NetFlow records from outside sources if it's necessary. Uh, I'll note that we don't actually recommend relying only on that method. Uh, it can be great supplemental data, but at the same time, if you're working with the NetFlow records, you're working with sample data uh, instead of the packet stream, uh, and then you're actually uh, not getting all the additional analysis that we can provide with our DPI engine. Uh, so to actually illustrate that, um, before we move on to some of the next technologies, I'll dive into the live demo environment uh, and kind of show a little bit of this right now. Uh, so I'll be jumping into application usage. Uh, for remote locations, the, you know, the most important troubleshooting tool that you have is really being able to segment the data, uh, and that's by location or by the application, by the user. Uh, so the first thing we're usually showing people is showing by location data. And I'll just switch around. So we have all of the Boston traffic and all of the uh, traffic that's coming through here, all of the different apps that we can identify. Uh, there are things like SSL where we're not gonna be able to peek inside that, but we can actually uh, stitch together some of these apps based on the destination and based on the style of traffic. So, uh, you know, we can identify something like YouTube based on the fact that it's probably gonna be UDB traffic going to a set of IP addresses. And so if I wanna look at something, uh, let's see, I want uh, to look at something like uh, Salesforce plugins. I can actually see this. I can see the contribution of that uh, traffic per uh, location, and I can dive into the location itself. So drilling into that specific location will actually bring up the, the top applications uh, being used at that location. Uh, and with something like Active Directory integration, which we have, you can actually see what users uh, are using that. So in this case, we've actually drilled into Salesforce already. And if I zoom in here, I can see that we actually have uh, plugin data coming from uh, Sam Sweeney over in our business operations department. Uh, so by, by kind of segmenting and kind of cross-sectioning the data, we can actually get to uh, things like the, the flows per second, the packets that are actually being sent from a user, uh, and really most importantly in this view, the retransmit rate. 
right? If it's something like an application traffic, retransmits is probably going to be your leading indicator for congestion. And so when we're looking at something like the traffic analysis, we want to be able to identify this right away. And I can alert on any single piece of this. Uh, so kind of for all those reasons of just bringing in all the apps, the users, bringing in the retransmit rates and, and doing this for all of your data, not just sample data from every location that you have and segmenting it that, uh, we go way beyond kind of the traditional NetFlow setup. Um, but it isn't the only data source that IT is relying on. Uh, so I'll actually jump back uh, and move on to the next one, which is going to be SNMP. So again, we run into a kind of a familiar protocol uh, designed for collecting metrics from devices and configuring them remotely. Uh, the trouble with monitoring via SNMP is twofold. Uh, first, you can only get SNMP information from devices you own. Uh, it's also a management protocol, so it'd be kind of foolish for SaaS vendors or ISPs to allow SNMP collection from external parties. Uh, secondly, the method with which you get data from SNMP is passive uh, and ultimately slow. Uh, to ensure that you don't negatively affect the performance of the device, SNMP is generally polled at 15-minute intervals, uh, while some metrics don't necessarily need to be collected faster. When considering the data storage required that you actually have to uh, store the data that you collect, uh, it does mean that device failure or degraded performance or any other type of indication uh, outside of SNMP traps uh, can be delayed uh, up to 15 minutes. Now, traps can obviously fill some of that gap, but you have to set it up. You have to configure the trap to actually tell you when something's going down. And at scale, that can be very difficult. So with SNMP, IT can map their internal network and get a good idea of where device-related issues are occurring in you know, a large corporate network. However, if a user calls complaining of a slow SaaS app, like how does SNMP actually help there? Uh, we can locate where the user is in the network topology and look at the path to the closest ISP egress, but if there are no issues along that path, then SNMP is actually a bit beyond its depth. And, and most importantly is that for, for monitoring infrastructure availability, SNMP can be invaluable. I, I'm not arguing that, but for monitoring end user experience, SNMP requires institutional knowledge and fundamentally misses most of the application delivery path between a user and something like a SaaS app or anything, uh, especially when you're talking about remote locations. So to illustrate the reach of SNMP, we can see that on the left of this chart, uh, that the kind of the office portion of the application delivery path is something that IT has direct access to, and therefore SNMP data can be gathered on things like the user's laptop computer, Wi-Fi access point, uh, routers, and the firewall. Uh, this chart is actually based on the key performance metrics that can be monitored via the technology on each of the rows. And so, you know, when I'm talking about the, F the AppNeta side, uh, we're considering latency, round trip time, jitter, loss, available, utilized in total capacity, uh, QoS, the all possible routes that are available versus the active route, the one the user is actually using. Uh, and for voice traffic specific, uh, voice loss, voice jitter, and the mean opinion score. SNMP can only monitor the own devices, uh, so the general WAN uh, and the SaaS vendor network can be annoyed, ignored kind of in the middle on the right there. Uh, and for internal metrics, we can look at the routes available from the topology, latency and loss from each device, and kind of point in space bandwidth metrics uh, that we could, I, you know, we could then infer capacity metrics that we compare uh, to the route, but we lose a lot of the context of these metrics if we're not tracking them over the path as a whole or over time or per user. Uh, so unfortunately for the for those monitoring solely with SNMP, uh, kind of the all important end user experience context is missed. Uh, but to be fair, uh, you know SNMP vendors uh, and some of them have integrated BGB monitoring to cover kind of the gap left in the WAN. Uh, so let's let's talk about that for a second before we jump back into the product. Um, you know, as we all know, BGP sits kind of on top of TCP at OSI layer four. Uh, it primarily comes up in discussions about uh, the interconnection between autonomous systems. Uh, when we talk about BGP here, here at Upneta, we're often referring to its use by other monitoring companies for monitoring purposes. So purposes other than which it was designed for. Uh, monitoring with BGP is passive, like we discussed with SNMP. Uh, it relies on polling, uh, so it's passive in that way. Uh, it's also designed to focus on a wider view of infrastructure uh, on the internet and not the actual application delivery path that a user would experience right before they call IT and complain. 
Uh, so BGP as the routing protocol uh, is therefore kind of removed from the user context uh, and doesn't give that end user view of performance that we're looking for. Uh, the protocols AppNeti uses uh, to measure the end user experience with our active monitoring are ICMP, TCP, and UDP. So ICMP on layer three provides kind of the lowest level information. It's used for our diagnostic testing, route determination, uh, and metric measurement at kind of all levels. Uh, TCP has guaranteed delivery, so you know we're, we're basically looking at application traffic in that standpoint. Uh, and by sending dispersed packet trains, AppNeta can determine if the application delivery path has actually altered the packets in order, uh, exhibits pa packet delay variation, uh, packets are lost, uh, and that basically jumbles into metrics like jitter loss, latency, and TCP retransmits uh, across all of your locations. And finally, UDP on layer four is the primary transport mechanism for voice and video. Um, UDP monitoring is primarily used for our dual-ended testing, where FNeta monitoring points act as both the endpoint, uh, basically the source and the destination of a collection, uh, connection, excuse me. Um, but again, we kind of come back to the question of comparison. <coughs> so adding VGP visibility to the chart, uh, we actually get a bit better uh, performance coverage in the office and a fair amount more of the value in the WAN. Uh, but beyond the limitations of the protocols themselves, we're also not going to see much in the way of fast vendor networks uh, to get a better picture of what this type of visibility uh, across the WAN from remote locations looks like when you are uh, actually troubleshooting. Let's dive back into uh, the AppNeta Performance Manager. So the first thing I'll show you is just uh, the pathless. Uh, we can uh, segment these by what you're actually trying to look at for traffic. Um, Damien was mentioning Office 365, so I'll actually start with that. Uh, and I've actually opened up one of the paths already uh, and added a little bit more data to it by putting it out to a day here. Uh, so the first thing you're going to see is basically our TCP, UDP, and ICMP route. Uh, and that's basically going to tell us when traffic actually moves. Uh, so when traffic is routed differently based on the protocol that's being sent, uh, and this happens more often than not. In this case, we're actually going a shorter amount. Uh, and so we're going uh, probably, uh, you know, probably a couple hundred miles from San Francisco to, I think in this case, we're probably talking about, you know, uh, Amazon West, uh, probably up in Oregon. So uh, if I'm looking down at something like the capacity, capacity is one of the biggest things that we talk about at FNETA because uh, capacity is uh, going to give you the best idea of what your application will actually experience across uh, the kind of source of destination between the user and a fast app because it's going to show you the bottlenecks. It's going to show you the lowest level that's possible. So even if you're paying for 250 megabits per second outside the office, you're probably not getting that all the way to the fast app. I think that's something that people often confuse is the concept of bandwidth and capacity. Right? So bandwidth is what you've actually paid for and the total size of the pipe and capacity is from my end user through the network to a specific endpoint. Yep, and, and every little piece of this chart is telling us a little bit, right? The utilized capacity is telling us uh, what the congestion is from, from our traffic and what we're seeing. Uh, available can dip depending on where the bottlenecks are, what congestion is happening outside of your control. Uh, and we actually have provision capacity as well. And you can either set that if you have an SLA with your ISP, or you could actually let that kind of float uh, if, you're, if you're trying to track whether or not uh, your ISP is, you know, kind of uh, under provisioning or something like that. Um, but what's, what's great about this, uh, this part of the product is that we can, we can start diving in and find things like data loss and find uh, different correlations between you know, capacity, which is probably a leading indicator. Uh, data loss, you can see this one has actually uh, got a lot of maximums in this darker orange line that are well above what you'd expect for, uh, for you know, a regular uh, connection. And so what, what happens with our, our kind of delivery side is that if any of these uh, thresholds are violated, these black lines, uh, we'll actually run a diagnostic. We'll automatically up the number of packets that we're sending over the line. Remember, we are active. We're sending packets every minute. We'll increase those numbers to confirm the issue. And if we can confirm that, yes, data loss is indeed uh, an issue right here, we'll actually kick off a diagnostic. And that diagnostic will then run um, a secondary test to all the different hops along the way. And I can actually look at the details um, uh, all the way across the line, so I can look at every hop and look at the loss, the capacity, the utilization. I can see if MTU drops. I can see uh, anything with latency issues, uh, and I can actually go in and see more information from our Apex engine 
that will start doing a diagnostic and tell us with a confidence score uh, what could actually be happening on the line. And so that's actually getting me to uh, the root cause of an issue instead of just giving me a couple metrics to decipher. Uh, and so that's where delivery really has a lot of the, uh, the kind of power uh, that other people are missing because we're actually able to dive from, you know, just a path that was created to Office 365 all the way to find out uh, what's happening along that path. So with that, I'll actually uh, jump back in. We'll go into uh, kind of uh, one of our last pieces here, uh, which is synthetic monitoring. So it's last on our list, but uh, it is key to tracking end user experience because it is actually a synthetic user. So rudimentary synthetic monitoring may do availability checks. Um, uh, to see whether an app is up or down by using kind of HTTP status codes. Uh, but uh, these fail because IT teams target the homepage of a company uh, instead of the login page of the app. And the login page is actually a poor substitute for a script that actually logs into the app, loads data like a user would, and you know, kind of clicks around and generally uses the application. So the other piece here is that apps rarely go down today. So availability isn't what we should be monitoring anymore. Uh, you know, in the early days of SaaS, under, under provisioning could occur, but auto scaling through AWS and uh, all the other cloud providers has alleviated much of that. And app slowdowns uh, are often much more complex uh, today than they were before when something broke and something just went down. Um, so better, more developed synthetic monitoring like Appnetos can actually simulate user interactions and get a real sense of what uh, the users see at any location, so from any location through any app. Uh, and we made better milestones on top of our synthetics so we can see logical transitions from the user experience rather than just the page transitions of clicking and finding a new page. Um, so the active monitoring via synthetics is essential uh, kind of in the complex infrastructure that many IT teams are managing uh, where multiple networks, providers, and applications can really consume IT time and resources most of the day. Uh, and synthetic monitoring is a big help for troubleshooting in these cases. Uh, since it shows IT kind of the historical context of the performance of an app. And they do work in co cooperation with the other capabilities that we've been going through, right? Synthetic scripts are used to show the, num the kind of the normal performance of an app over time so that you can alert as an IT team on the deviations from the norm and take action and kind of get proactive instead of waiting for user complaints to come in. And you know, taking action typically uh, requires more information. So Appnetto is going to provide you with that network context. And uh, if you have the, the, uh, the usage uh, installed at a remote office, it will even tell you what that user was doing at the same time. So correlating, correlating kind of the route, the app, the end user uh, at the time of the incident is crucial to understanding the root cause. Uh, and so to understand that, let's jump back into the product. So I have a bunch of web groups here, which are all kind of the combination of a location, uh, a target, and a script. And so if I look at one of these, um, let's <coughs> excuse me, let's configure this so I can see that I'm monitoring from Boston and Vancouver, our two offices, uh, to Microsoft Online with a login, and I'm actually running a Selenium script. If I want to see that script, I can jump in. I can see I'm bringing the Selenium source and then parsing it into this table view. And then I'm adding these milestones um, that are basically going to show me uh, when things are either clicked or when things are moved around. Well, the milestones are really important because we've got these single, this concept now of single page apps, right? Like Gmail is a great example of that, where there aren't page transitions. Right. And we also have actually a user question here, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, what is this, what is this already a Selenium script running? How, do, how does that matter handle that? Meaning if we already own one, if it's already created, mm -hmm. you can port it over in most cases yep. and run it right in our, mm -hmm. right in our appliances. Yes, that was a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so basically the Selenium that we use is Selenium. Uh, we actually take advantage of the comments to run our milestones. We have a comment syntax that will allow us to add milestones. So when you use an AppNeta script outside of AppNeta, it will still run because it will just see it as comments but in our system, it will read those comments as milestones and actually add something on top of the Selenium script. Uh, so both ways, Selenium, either way. Um, so to, let's, let's dive into one of these just to get a little bit more uh, and see what we can actually find from these Selenium scripts. So if I'm looking at Selenium script, I'm looking at basically 
the network transport timing, the server side response, and the browser rendering of the objects on the page uh, through uh, this network server and browser chart. I can actually break down um, by milestone, and this one actually looks like the milestone failed, so I want to find out what happened there. I can see that I never uh, got to the admin page, so I can figure out what happened in my script or what happened in the test. Um, but I can also dive down to a waterfall chart. So if you use Chrome Inspector um, or uh, Firefox Inspect, you're going to see a lot of what's going on. So here I can see I've got a snapshot. I can see that uh, it looks like the page loaded fine, but maybe there was a, an issue after uh, after this part. I can see the page load timings of all the different pieces. I can see it from uh, a per milestone basis. So here I can just you know click and it will auto sort to this uh, this part of the milestone or this single milestone and show me the uh, kind of the waterfall chart, but it'll show me the resource timing, domain uh, content and performance issues as well. Uh, and so what's, what's great about this uh, part of the product is that we can actually do this from behind the firewall with our, our basically our, our devices, either virtual or physical, or we can do it from our global monitoring points. And so being able to put one of these at a remote location so that you're actually uh, triggering a synthetic script from uh, a place where your users actually are, and with our small office appliance, you can even do it over Wi-Fi to get even closer to what the user would actually see. Uh, all these kind of combine to show that we can give you not only the, the user context of something like synthetics, but we can also bring in the network context and basically the entire path uh, between uh, your user and the app in question, whether or not you own it or whether or not it's a SaaS app. Uh, and so with that, uh, let's uh, send it back to Damien so that he can uh, kind of revisit. Uh. All right. Thank you. That was great. Um, I know we're running over here. We try and keep these to 30 minutes. Uh, it's always hard because there's so much stuff to cover. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes. Just a reminder, we will be sending out a recording. So if anybody has to leave, you know, we will, the recording will be going out. But let me just... What I wanted to do is take that example that we started off with of troubleshooting and a problem with Office 365 and now look at it from the point of view of somebody that has that meta in their in their tool set. So the, the first thing is that if you remember uh, at the beginning that the first point of contact was the user letting the IT professional know that there was a problem with the application. Um, and I believe we had it triggering at 1 p.m. Well, in, in, in the world of App Meta, you're going to get a proactive email because that application will have exceeded a, one of a numerous thresholds, whether it's on network or whether it's on application delivery or from a usage standpoint, dropping packets, whatever it is, you're going to get warned ahead of time before that user picks up the phone and files that first ticket. So then once you have that information, it really just, you know, the, the really nice thing about using App Meta Performance Manager is that you don't have to log in to 17 different tools in order to figure out or solve the problem. So you log into Meta. I usually start in usage, and uh, I actually did this for troubleshooting Salesforce here at, uh, at our office. You can read a blog post about it. Um, and so what I check first is, are there, is there another application running that could be sucking up bandwidth across the company or across this particular location that could be affecting performance? with um, not so much with Office 365, but with, with VoIP and video applications, that's often the first place that I'll look because those applications are very sensitive to loss of, of bandwidth in that way. Okay, so I don't find anything there. So then I check the application or synthetic applications. Uh, so that's the last section that Alec covered in terms of experience. Um, and I see that there are some points at which the application was unreachable. Huh, okay, so that's interesting. So then what I can do is then drill in right from there into the synthetic network test, and I can see everything that uh, all the, uh, the the performance of our net, the network connectivity that exists between that end user in that remote location um, and and the application. And I can also, by the way, compare office against office. I can compare user against user, so I can really see what's happening very quickly. For instance, in the case of troubleshooting Salesforce, uh, what I did was I checked against our Vancouver office and against one of our global monitoring points, and I could see that the application wasn't accessible from the, only the Boston office. So the problem wasn't just in, uh, what was along the unique path that connected Boston to that instance of Salesforce. That's an important thing to realize that as applications like Salesforce and Office 365 get bigger, 
they're going to get more distributed. So you can't guarantee that the infrastructure that one remote office is accessing is the same infrastructure that you're accessing. So that this allows you to easily compare them. And then uh, finally, I submit a ticket to the ISP, uh, and they love us over here, so they always take our tickets and process them as quickly as possible, and then they resolve it. Um, you know, it literally took when when I was you know, and I'm the CMO, I'm not the most technical guy here in in the building, and even I was able to troubleshoot the Salesforce issue in in about five minutes. Anyway, that's that's the end of it. Um, Hopefully, hopefully this is useful. One thing that I wanted to say is that if you're interested in trying it out for yourself, we have a live interactive demo that anybody can access at any time. Go and sign up. It's at tryupneta.com, and uh, you can experience all these different components yourself. Um, we welcome your feedback on this webinar, or if you've got other questions, I put we put our email address up that, uh, for both uh, myself and Alan, so you can tweet at us at, at Upneta. Uh, we are over, so I don't know that we're going to have time for a lot of questions, but maybe one, two. Yeah, I think yeah. we could do, there's one question that a user has about um, Wi-Fi. So I see that Wi-Fi was mentioned on one of the slides. Can you talk a little bit more about um, monitoring Wi-Fi? Sure. At, at Meta has got a pretty unique solution in terms of monitoring the Wi-Fi because our, our small office solution comes with a built-in uh, Wi-Fi point. So it attaches to your Wi-Fi network just like your users would, and it also doesn't just attach and stay attached. It can actually initiate the, the whole process of attaching to the Wi-Fi network um, and then breaking that connection down and redoing it again so that you're testing the complete Wi-Fi experience. And that gives you the ability to see, you know, Wi-Fi used to be this kind of nice add-on, but now it's business critical, right? In, in our office here at Abneta, everybody's on Wi-Fi all the time. And so it's critical to be able to look at the connectivity and the performance of applications over that Wi-Fi connection in addition to over the wired connection. So hopefully that answers the question. Great, thanks. Okay. Any, any others? All right, looks like I'm being shooed away because of time. All right, <laughs> fine. Anyway, I hope that all of you enjoyed this. Um, again, we will have a recording going out right after this. And I want to thank Alec and Christine, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. So have a great day. Have a great day.